clarity is always a really good thing, isn't it? I don't know about you, but there might not be anything more frustrating than not having any idea what your job is or not knowing what someone expects you to do for them. If you were to think back on some of your least productive days, I'm guessing it would probably be related to not having any idea what it was that you were supposed to do, not having a clear focus lined out. And you spent the day moving around without knowing exactly what it was you were supposed to be accomplishing. But I'm also guessing that some of your most productive and focused days occur when you wake up with a singular purpose and your mind is on that task and you are, you are setting out to accomplish it. You know what you need to do. The clarity of having a goal and a focus makes sure that you're moving forward. It makes sure that you're doing what actually matters. Now, as we continue to see the ministry of Jesus unfold here in the early part of Luke, we see that Jesus understands what it is that he's come to do. He's come to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. And we get good insight here into what that looked like in this passage that we've read today. And so let's line out our three points so that we can follow the text where it leads us. Now the first thing that we're going to see is that Jesus has authority over unclean spirits. As we continue to see the ministry of Jesus unfold here in Luke, we're being told stories for a reason. You've heard me say before, Jesus lived 33 years, and yet everything we know about him is in these four books, right? Not every story of Jesus' life is in the Gospels. But the ones that are there, they're there for a purpose, they're there for a reason. So is Jesus just an ordinary guy wandering the countryside spouting words of wisdom to those passing by? Or do the words that he has to say have authority? By showing us this encounter with an unclean spirit, we see that Jesus has power and authority beyond that of an ordinary person. Secondly, we're going to see that Jesus has authority over sickness. Now, we've gotten the idea in Luke thus far that Jesus is special. We've seen that in his birth and in the people who came to celebrate his being presented at the temple, uh, the way he taught in the, in the temple courtyard when he was 12. We've seen the special nature of Jesus here in Luke. And now we are seeing that, that he's done some healing. But as the ministry of Jesus is being lined out for us here, we see that this teaching, this speaking, is, is the big part of what he does Jesus is not just a teacher. He's not an ordinary teacher. He's a teacher from God, and his power to heal makes that clear. It lets us know that he's not just an ordinary rabbi teaching in the synagogue or anywhere else. The authority to heal shows that Jesus is special. Finally, we see that Jesus has come to spread the message of the kingdom of God. Jesus hasn't come to settle down in one place and build up his own little tiny kingdom of followers. He could have done that in Capernaum, as we see mentioned here, and gotten everybody around him and, and had a big influence. But he's not here to stay in one place and build up his own little cadre of followers, right? He is making his way all throughout Judea, we read. And he's going to the synagogues. The message that Jesus has is important. And it has to be taken to the people. So let's get underway here in this passage as we look at how Luke tells us about the authority that Jesus has over an unclean spirit. And as we start up here, it's important that we remember where we were at last week. You'll recall that Jesus was in his hometown and, and things didn't go too well. You'll remember he read from the book of Isaiah and he said that the prophecy there about the Messiah was fulfilled in him. And initially, 
The people thought that was kind of great, but then things escalated rather quickly to the point of people wanting to stone him, right? But what happened? Jesus walked through the crowd safely because it wasn't his time yet. He was not going to suffer harm. So now we see that Jesus has left Nazareth. He's going down to Capernaum, and he's staying in the same region in Galilee. He's in the same general vicinity, but now we're seeing him moving away from his hometown. Now notice here that once again, we're told that Jesus is teaching on the Sabbath. Now I think, if you're like me, for the most part, the picture that we have in our mind of Jesus teaching is he's kind of wandering around the countryside and suddenly the mood strikes, he finds a hill and he teaches to people. That's the idea that we get. Now this certainly may have been the case But the idea being expressed here in Luke is that Jesus is teaching on the Sabbath and he's in the synagogues. Now, I think this is important for us to understand because it lets us know that Jesus is going to the people of his day deliberately. He was teaching, he was preaching, he was going where the people were, but he wasn't just preaching his random thoughts on the hillside. He was going to where the scripture was being read, and as we saw last week, he was explaining it. So he's going where scripture life of Jesus looked like here, but with what is revealed to us in Luke right now, you get a sense of the methodology and the rhythm of the ministry of Jesus. It's relatively ordinary. He's going to the synagogues, and like I said, singing psalms, reading scripture, preaching, And we think about what it says here next about being astonished at his teaching. These facts about where Jesus is teaching and preaching should help us to appreciate what Luke is driving at here. These are not people on the side of the road saying that the teaching of Jesus is amazing compared to the other guy who was walking down the road and telling us what he thought. Jesus is going into the places where the people are used to hearing the teaching of God's word. And we're seeing that there is just something different about him. His his teaching is different than the other rabbis who they hear on other Sabbath days. The The people here believe and they hear what Jesus has to say and they can understand the authority that Jesus has while he's teaching. The teaching of Jesus is just different. It's different. Now you know this from things that you enjoy, or from personal areas of expertise that you have in your life, right? There are some people who you will walk over glass to hear speak or to read uh, their book on a topic because, because they are the one that you trust. You know that when they talk about the topic that you care about, they understand it and get it better than anybody else. We, we see this in our day. People like that What they have to say carries more weight with us, right? You can just feel when they talk that they really know their stuff. And so we can see this with Jesus. Jesus was that guy, but he was so much more. He spoke as though he really knew, and of course he did. He spoke as if he really understood what was being taught in the scriptures. He spoke with authority and he spoke with power. And as the text continues, we get the idea that this isn't just a matter of personal opinion either. It isn't just that some people prefer the teaching style of Jesus. He has an authority beyond personal opinion. And Luke shows us this by showing this authority that he has over the evil spirit we read about here. Now, I think it's important to point out the unique nature of of what we're reading in this text. If you go through the Bible, you read the Bible, there aren't very many demon possessions in the pages of Scripture. And most of them are found in the Gospels. And we see that these demons were able to identify Jesus as the Messiah. In other words, this demonic activity that we see that is heightened in the Gospels is because of the opposition to the work of the Son of God. The evil spirits are opposing the Messiah. This story, and others like it, in the Gospels, 
are to let us know something about who Jesus is and what he's come to do. We're to feel the gravity of the ministry of Jesus in the fact that demons oppose him. And so we see that this man, who has an unclean demon, cries out and he interrupts what Jesus is saying. Now, I have always gotten a little kick out of this phrase in this passage of Luke, an unclean demon, as opposed to a clean demon. Is that demon the one who his mom told him to go clean his room and he did it right away? Anyway, uh, maybe, this is the, 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 maybe this is the demon who didn't wash his hands before he ate. I, I don't know. But I would think all demons would be considered to be unclean. But the point here is clear. This is one who is opposing the work of God. And it's clear in the words that this demon utters. What do you have to do with us? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now let's take a second to break down what's being said here. Because this short collection of word really, really packs a punch. Notice that the demon is able to identify Jesus. And then notice that there's also a sense of fear here. That he has power over this demon. He knows that Jesus has the power to destroy evil spirits. Well, then this, uh, this demonic being identifies Jesus even further. Because he's more than just someone from Nazareth. He calls him something. He says, I know you're the Holy One of God. Now you can tell, by the way, our English Bibles capitalize this, that this is important. The demon isn't just saying that Jesus is someone who lives in an upright way and lives a godly life. That's not what Holy One means here. This is a messianic title. The demon is, is cluing us in that this is the Messiah, the Holy One of God. Jesus is the guy we've been waiting for. And what we see is that the authority that Jesus is teaching with is not that he's just the best teacher on the block. While he may, and probably does, have the best rhetorical skills around, his authority is rooted in something more than just skilled, skilled speech, or an excellent grasp of language. Jesus is something more, and even the evil spirits know. And we see that even when this demon speaks truth, Jesus has power over the demon. He is able to silence it and cause it to leave the man. And the man is not even harmed after being thrown down. Jesus is amazing! And the people notice it. Look at their reaction. What is going on here? It isn't that Jesus just speaks well. It isn't that he really knows his Bible. Even unclean spirits obey him. This is something more than just an ordinary man. He is the one. And that's the big story in this small story. Jesus has authority to teach. And it's a divine authority ordained by God. And you can imagine the people leaving that place. I mean, what would you do? You'd go out and say, you will not believe what happened in church on Sunday. Right? Imagine how the word would spread. They had heard good teachers before. But the word on the street is that Jesus is different. And we're going to see this point continue as we move on to the sec second part of our passage today and our second point where we see that Jesus even has authority over sickness. Now as we transition to verse 38, we encounter a familiar name, but if you and I were just coming to the text of Luke for the first time and, the, and to the Christian story for the first time, we'd likely be wondering why we're hearing a name without knowing who this person is. Notice that, that Simon comes up, right? Now we know who that is, it's Peter. But his name comes up. Luke hasn't mentioned him before. We haven't, we haven't seen anything about this. Jesus leaves the synagogue. He goes to someone named Simon's house. And as I said, this is Simon Peter. And we haven't heard anything about him yet. And in fact, we won't see Jesus calling the disciples in Luke until next week when we venture into chapter 5. But here we have Jesus going to Simon's house. And we don't have knowledge of his relationship to Simon at this time. But clearly... They know each other. So what we find is that Peter's mother-in-law is quite ill. We read that she has a high fever. Now remember, 
They weren't going to send Simon out down to the local pharmacy to pick up some ibuprofen or some acetaminophen to bring her fever down. This fever was a very dangerous thing. Now, we worry about fevers. We do. But generally, we have common treatments that we can use. But that simply wasn't the case in the first century. Remember, an infection until relatively recent history, it either was going to pass or it was going to take your life. There weren't antibiotics. There weren't treatments for a lot of this stuff. The likelihood of dying from something like that was much higher than what you and I experience in our day. So this is a big deal. Don't read fever here and think, meh, he healed the fever. This was a big deal. This was a blessing because they don't, ha- they don't have the blessings we have because we have modern treatments. They didn't have that. This isn't just an inconvenience for Peter's family that someone is sick and Jesus is taking care of it. This fever is a crisis of life and death. And so they make an appeal to Jesus for Simon's mother-in-law. Now clearly the people in the household have knowledge of who Jesus is. They have knowledge of, of stuff that he's done already. There is substantial faith in this house. There's a trust in this household that Jesus can do this. They're putting their hope that Jesus will heal her. And this instance of healing is a rather interesting one. The the different ways that Jesus heals in the Gospels is, is varied, right? They're all interesting. But this first healing that we see, the details of here in Luke, shows us what we're talking about today. It shows us the authority that Jesus has. So he stands over Peter's mother-in-law, and what does he do? Does he touch her? Does he, you know, put something on her? No, he speaks. It tells us that he rebukes the fever. Now imagine being able to stand over someone and simply say, fever, be gone, and that person is healed. That's amazing power. And we're meant to feel just how amazing this is by the way that Luke describes the recovery. Jesus doesn't heal her, and she says, whew, I feel better, but it's going to take a while. I'm going to finish binge-watching this series on Netflix I was watching while I wasn't feeling well. Then maybe I'll get my legs under me, and, and, and we'll see how I'm doing. Maybe I can go back to work in a couple days. That's not what happens. Instead, we read that she rises immediately and serves the people around her. Her healing is not Jesus making the infection go away, And then she feels a little bit better later on after some rest. The healing that Jesus brings is absolute. And so we're meant to take notice of this because we're being told that Jesus teaches with authority. And then we see that he speaks and he has authority over demons. The demons have ears to hear, but notice the infection does not have ears to hear this rebuke. Jesus speaks and has authority and power even over things that can't hear him. He has power and authority over everything. Jesus speaks and stuff happens. He has authority as a teacher, but also one as one who speaks and everything around him acknowledges that he has authority. That's what we're meant to feel. So do you feel the idea of flowing out of the text here. Jesus is the Holy One of God, and when he speaks, you should listen. Because even the demons, even nature is subject to him. And as we set out to hear more about Jesus, that's what Luke wants us to understand. That's why he's telling these stories here in Luke chapter 4, to understand that this guy we're going to be reading more about, he has authority. And he drives it home even further by telling us that Jesus is healing even more people and casting out even more demons. People are bringing their sick to him. And he heals them, and demons come out of them. And once again, these demons are also able to identify him as the Son of God. But we see that Jesus once again keeps them silent because it's not time for everyone to hear that he's the Christ yet. It's not time yet. And as we move on to the final few verses of our passage for today, we see that this is the ministry of Jesus. It's what he has come to do. 
Now we find that Jesus goes away to a desolate place, and, and we find Jesus doing this throughout the Gospels. He goes off by himself to pray or to rest, but people still seek him out, and of course they're still seeking him out, right? You know someone? You would like Jesus to heal? I'm sure you do. You'd take them to him. You'd bother him. It wouldn't matter, wouldn't matter where he was. You would take them to him, and that's what they're doing here. They have desires, they have needs that they believe Jesus can fill, so they seek him out. And so we see that they want to keep him for themselves. Now this is not a heavily populated region, but there are enough people there, and there are enough problems that Jesus could spend his time fulfilling their needs. But the idea that we're meant to feel here is that, that he hasn't come for just one region. And he's not come for just one group of people. He tells them that, that he has to move on because he must preach the good news of the kingdom to the other towns as well. And notice the two words here, I must. This needs to be done. It must continue. It must go forward. And we have to understand in looking at this that Jesus is on mission. He isn't moving around haphazardly in his, mission, in his ministry. He has a purpose, and he's going to stay on task proclaiming the kingdom of God. And this is the first time we see that statement from Luke, the kingdom of God. It's the first time we hear it, but he's going to use it many, many times. Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God more than anything else in his teaching ministry. But this is the first time. So what is Jesus doing? He's proclaiming the reign of God. He's proclaiming the truth of his kingdom, not just in Capernaum, but in all the regions. It has to go out to the world. And why is that? Just like I said before, it's because he must. That is his mission. And Jesus confirms this as we see him say that he was sent for this purpose. In the midst of casting out demons, in the midst of healing the sick, Jesus is making it clear that that's not his purpose for coming. The miracle, miracles show us that he has authority to teach as the Holy One of God, but the important part of his ministry is not making people well, and it's not rebuking evil spirits. The real mission of Jesus is to proclaim the kingdom of God, the coming reign of the ascended Son of God, is where this story is going. That's how Luke ends, remember? The ascension. That's where the story's going. And so he's telling about the good news of this reign of God, and that is far better news than healing fevers. That's far better news than making the blind see. It's more important than causing the lame to walk. And it's more important than causing the deaf to hear. The kingdom of God in its proclamation about the forgiveness of sins and breaking the chains of sins and, and bearing the wrath of God, the proclamation of that good news is more important than all the healing that he could ever do. The story of the reign of God is his purpose. That's what he's come to do. And so this is the purpose of that he was sent for, and we read that it's what he does. He, he continues doing what he's been doing. We see here, he goes about preaching in the synagogues all throughout Judea. Yes, Jesus is going to heal. He's going to heal. Yes, he is still going to cast out demons. But at the end of the day, he's going to proclaim a message. And he is going to the people of God in the synagogues, where the psalms are sung and the words of scripture are read, and he is going to teach with authority so that people can hear the good news of the reign of God's kingdom. So what do you and I take away from these 14 verses today? As we finish up the fourth chapter of Luke, what can you and I take into the world this week as we desire to be God's faithful servants in his world? Well, there has been one consistent theme through the text that we've been looking at today, and that is that the word of the Lord, the word of Jesus, has authority. When he speaks, 
Not only do people listen, but evil spirits and even nature is subject to what he has to say. So how much more so should you and I submit ourselves to the authority of what the Lord has spoken? And the question is, do we really believe that Jesus has authority? It is easy for us to talk about the authority of Scripture when it's the things we agree with or the things that are easy, right? The question that we need to ask ourselves is where do we have areas in our lives where we find ourselves refusing to submit to what the authority of the Lord has spoken? Do we really believe that he has the authority to tell us how to live? Do we really believe that he has the authority to tell us how to worship? Do we let the little things go because God doesn't really care? Or do we allow those things to have the things that Jesus has to say about what we consider to be little things? Do we allow the authority of Jesus to stand there as well? So easy to say that we believe Jesus. So easy to say that we believe that he has authority, but then boldly live like you and I have authority. So easy. We believe that we have the standard on how you and I should live as opposed to God's word and what God has spoken. And this is a struggle, not just for us, it's a struggle in every age. And the question we ask ourselves is, will we trust the word of the Lord to have authority in our lives, in how we live, in how we worship, in, in what we believe, or are you and I going to be in the position of authority? And so I believe submitting to this authority of the word of God begins with going back to the purpose for which Jesus came. His purpose was to go out and proclaim the reign of the kingdom of God, to proclaim the good news. See, you and I are a people who need to continually hear the word of the Lord because we will forget it. If we don't persistently have it in our ears and in our hearts and our minds, we are going to forget and so we need to put ourselves in the presence of the word of God, in the presence of the people of God. We need to be proclaiming the kingdom of God and proclaiming that his reign has come because Jesus has taken on the wrath of God for our sin and in his death. And he rose from the dead for our salvation. And now he reigns at the Father's right hand. This truth must have authority in our lives because it's the gospel. The message that saves us, the message that fills us with hope and fills us with joy. And our submitting to the authority of God starts with understanding the gospel. Because if, if I don't understand that I'm a sinner in need of God's grace, I'm not going to find it very necessary to submit to the authority of God's law, am I? If I don't understand that my forgiveness isn't about me, but about the price that Jesus paid for me, I won't be very likely to think that I need to submit to Jesus because, hey, I can do this on my own. If I don't understand that Jesus paid the price for my sin and, and rose again to defeat death, I'm not going to think that there's very much value in sharing the gospel because I will think that the story of, of Jesus is just, just about this life. And there's all kinds of paths to earthly happiness out there. There's all kinds of paths to earthly pleasure. You see, when we start with the gospel, we get the reason that Jesus came right. And it flows into how we view the world and how we view our place in the world. And because Jesus, Jesus is at the center of our salvation from sin, death, and hell, we will see then that he is our only hope. And he has the place of authority, not only in the highest heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, but in the seat of our lives as well. And so, may we see Jesus as the one who has authority in our lives, that we might have peace, that we might have joy, and so that we might faithfully share the message that Jesus shared, the coming reign, and the now here reign of God the Son at the right hand of the Father, the one who is interceding for us. And may we not only hear this message and believe it, but may we submit to the authority of the one who is Lord of heaven and earth.
Amen.